Continuing in The Great Turkey Walk by Kathleen Carr. We're in Chapter 5. Jefferson City was the biggest place I'd ever seen. People back home had told me it could, couldn't hold a candle to St. Louis, but it looked good to me. Take that Capitol building. Made out of blocks of carved stone it was. And it had columns standing all up and down its front. I couldn't help but stop cold before it and gape like the farm boy I used to be. It wasn't every day you got to see the capital of the capital city of the great state of Missouri. And churches. There was churches any which way you turned. I counted six or seven of them, every religion you could imagine. But general sightseeing wasn't why I'd truly come into Jefferson City. Why I'd truly left our camp just outside of the capital was on account of a broadsheet that had been hammered up to the sign pointing into town. It was the pictures that caught my attention, but I stood and carefully worked out the words, too, one at a time. Biggest Little Circus of 1860. Jefferson City. Tonight. The picture showed a strange creature with this big old hump just lodging on its back, like it belonged there. Next to it was a lion, and to the other side, a tiger. I knew about lions and tigers from a picture book Miss Rogers had in the schoolroom for when she gave her annual talk on deepest, darkest Africa and exotic Asia. I'd heard that talk about eight times over the years. Never thought I'd see me real lions and tigers, though. But here they was, like a gift. Wasn't no way I could turn down that kind of a present. I ran from the broadsheet back to where Bidwell Peace was giving the mules a rub down. I got to go into Jefferson City tonight, Mr. Peace. His hand stopped at steady stroking motion. Thought we was just going to head in far enough in the morning to pick up the next road west, seeing as all roads in Missouri spiral into Jefferson City. Thought we was going to avoid confusing the birds at the real big town. I ain't taking the turkeys with me, Mr. Peace. I don't want them confused any more than you. But I need to go into Jefferson City. I truly do. He moved to another section of brown boy's flanks and began his rubbing again a little more tentatively. I could go with you, keep you out of trouble. What trouble? Only kind of trouble I could foresee was Mr. Peace getting near any saloons, of which a genuine river town and capital had to have lots. Even Uncle Lucas had said as how laws ain't never been made on sweet cider. Nevertheless, I think it would be a good idea for me to come with you, Simon. Come where? Jabeth had finally caught up with us from his day trailing along behind in the woods. This time, he had a string of squirrels slung over his shoulder. He offered them to Mr. Peace. Squirrels was mighty dumb today. Just to stood there, chatting her in, in the trees, whilst I let fly with my knife. Hope you knows how to make squirrel stew, Mr. Peace, sir. That distracted my drover for a moment. His eyes lit up. Brunswick stew, J. Beth. Simmered with some of that. Their hard corn. Of that their hard corn we're carrying for the birds. Tastiest thing you ever set your teeth into. Fine. I started sauntering off. You just save me a portion for when I get back. Back from where? J. Beth asked again. You going into Jefferson City, Simon, sir? Take me with you, please. I ain't never seen a capital city. Didn't like to do it, but I had to put my foot down. Think that's the smartest thing you could do, Jabeth Value? If you really and truly have a bounty on a, out on you? He hung his head. I turned to Mr. Peace. I could tell saloons had won out over Brunswick Stew in his mind again. Could see it in the set of his eyes. I stomped out that tam temptation fast. The two of you got to look after each other and the birds. Now I'm trusting you both. I won't be that long. Maybe a little past dark. Here? The circus was set up on a field next to the river. It was just past a row of big stone and brick houses all squinched up into each other, with long porches running across their fronts on each floor. So a body could set out and admire that Missouri. I admired it for a spell myself. There was one or two flat boats left over from the old days, but mostly it was steamboats pulled up next to the docks. I sure would have liked to see how those paddle wheels worked, but there was no smoke coming from any stacks, so I headed over to the circus tent. It must have been getting on toward time for the show because people was starting to line up for tickets. There were lots of youngsters jumping around, excited, and plenty of grown-ups looking near the same. I didn't buy me a ticket, though, because the only money I had was Miss Rogers's, and that was meant for dire emergencies. So far, I'd only cut into it for that ferry boat toll. I thought maybe I'd find me a hole somewhere in that big tent and see what I could see. Except there was other things going on along the way to the tent. 
There's a stand where men were shooting at targets. I walked closer and puzzled out the sign atop it. It said for five cents you could take a chance and win a prize. There was a whole row of prizes, just crowding a shelf, too. Over the crack of rifle shots, I studied them. Crockery. It wasn't nothing but little gross, but little crockery gim cracks of puppies and kittens and such. I snorted. Didn't look like no nickel's worth of prize to me. Farther down the way, a little table was set out. Something more interesting was going on there. A fellow in a fancy embroidery ve embroidered vest and garters on his shirt sleeves was giving a high, giving a pitch about how a sharp person could make his fortune mighty fast. Meanwhile, he was playing with these three funny-looking things. It seemed like furry brown balls that had been sawed in half. They was curious, so I barreled through the crowd of men to see better. Cocoa nuts, the fellow was chanting. Cocoa nuts can be faster than the eye, but they don't lie. He lifted one of them coconut things. It was all hollowed out, and sitting underneath was this shiny silver dollar. Nice as you please. And he clapped that shell back on and swirled the three around some more. Lifted another one. There sat that dollar again. Put your money down, gentlemen. It's easy as pie. Coconuts don't lie. A fat man next to me offered two bits. Them coconuts started in moving again. When they stopped, he pointed. The shell was lifted. Sure and certain. There was that silver dollar. The fat man picked up his quarter and the dollar both and walked off looking mighty pleased with himself. See how easy it is, gentlemen? The fellow in the fancy vest said again. He pulled another shiny silver dollar from his vest pocket and slapped it down. Put your money on the table and make the first piece of your fortune. All this time, my fingers were in my pocket, hanging on to Miss Rogers' emergency money. If I was to take a chance on just two bits of it, why, I'd have a lot more right back right quick. I figured for a minute before I could work out exactly how much more that'd be. It finally came to me. Four times as much. Plus, I got to keep the original quarter. That way I could buy me a quarter ticket to see the show and be educated by real lions and tigers. Also, there was that humpbacked thing I was developing a remarkable interest in. All around, it seemed like an investment even Miss Rogers would be proud of. I pulled out a quarter and plunked it down. The fellow in the vest grinned up at me. Here's a young man with foresight. A young man with big things ahead of him. That being the nicest thing anybody said to me in some time, I blushed a little. The gentleman raised all three of them coconuts so as I could see... Proper that two was empty underneath, and one had the new silver dollar. Keep your eye on the coin. Then he moved them all around real fast. I stared hard as I could at the one with the money underneath of it. Hard as I could. Finally, he stopped. I looked up a little dizzy. Call your choice, young man. I looked down again, knowing exactly which one of them coconut things was holding my new silver dollar. I pointed. He picked up the shell. I stared. It ain't there. My two bits wasn't either. It was already in his pocket. Gotta keep sharp, young man. Give it another try. Well, I knew I could do it this time. I fetched out another quarter. Got dizzy again. But this time, I didn't lift my eyes. I kept him right where, right on that coconut that held my rightful money. I pointed. It was empty again. I raised my head to those grinning eyes like a fox's they was. Now, I ain't never been known for having a temper, but of a sudden I saw red. I just lost me the self-same thing as two complete turkeys. Didn't help that them other men to the right and left of me was laughing up their sleeves either. You gold me. I reached over that little table for the man in the fancy vest. His face turned shades of green and pink to match the vest stitching in my big hands, grabbed a hold of his shoulders and shook. You gold me and I won't be gold. It's a game of chance, he started. He stopped as I shook harder. Then he seemed to gather all his strength together to roar out one word. Samson! The strongest arms I ever felt were pulling me off of the coconut man. I let go of the bundle in my hands to turn and grapple with them. The crowd parted in anticipation of a good old fight. And it would have been, too, if I hadn't have looked up. Past the chest and shoulders, every bit as broad and brawny as mine, into a face near a head taller than me, and clear through eyes as wide and green as my own. The fight went out of me. I was staring at my own image. Just like when I'd sneak a glance into Aunt Mabel's looking glass, looking glass in the parlor back on the farm. Except there was a difference. I knew I was looking at me older. He must have been looking at himself younger, too. Because the strength went out of his grip the same way. We just stood there. Arms dangling by our sides. Just stood and stared at each other. What are you doing, Samson? The man in the vest was shouting. He edged nearer, cautiously. That lout near to kill me. 
Sansom shoved him away. Shut up, Cleaver. Apply your gl- gambling tricks on someone else. Not, I couldn't be mistaken on my only son. I gulped. It'd taken me a while, as per usual, to come to any conclusions. But how many Samsons could there be in Missouri? How many that was the spitting image of me? Pa? It came out in a squeak. I cleared my throat and tried again. You my pa, Samson Green? What's been gone these last ten long years? Those huge arms came around and grabbed me up in a bear hug. Like to take all the stuffing that was left out of me. It did. Simon! Then he said it again. Simon! He dropped me and I worked my lungs like a bellows for a full minute. When I had all my air back, I stared up at him again. You're so glad to see me. How's it you didn't come looking back to the farm? How's it you had no other interest in me since Mama went to her reward? Chapter 6 I didn't get my answer right then and there. Instead, Pa drug me off by the arm. Later. We'll work it all out later. Right now, it's time for the show. He walked me through the big tent opening, right past the crowds, pressing to get in. Right past the ticket taker, standing there with his hand out. Inside the tent, Pa shoved me into a front row seat. Don't move. I've got to get into my costume. What costume? You'll see. Don't dare shift an inch. Then he was gone. I stretched my legs out an inch, then a full foot, testing. That tent roof didn't fall in on me. Nothing happened at all, except the rows of board seats around and behind me started to fill up with people. I settled in to wait. Pretty soon, a man with a big mustache and a black stovepipe hat and red coat came into the center of the tent. Music started sawing up from three musicians tucked off in a far corner. The circus began. I near forgot about finding my long-lost paw in the doings of the next hour or so. The show started off right under the tent roof, swaying to the music. She did some amazing tricks up there. Oh, wait. The show started off with a pretty lady hanging from this little bitty swing right under the tent roof. Swaying to the music, she did some pretty amazing tricks up there. It was kind of hard to concentrate on the tricks, though, on account of the fact that she's wearing next to nothing. I swear. My eyes near to popped out at them delicate legs covered in not but tight yellow stockings. And the rest of her done up something shiny, with not a whole lot of that either. Well, mine wasn't the only eyes popping, I can say that much. Next come two silly little men dressed up in rags with big red noses. They fooled around with the swing, too. But it had been lowered barely off the ground, and anyway, they kept tumbling off it. That got the crowd to roaring. Then there was this trained dog act that started me thinking about Emmett and how Mr. Peace and Jabeth was doing without me back at camp. It took them circus people a while, but they finally brought on the lions and tigers, except there was only one of each. They put them in a little cage they built right in the center of the ring and made them jump through some hoops. The cats didn't take to the work much, besides which they was looking a little long in the tooth to begin with. I guess the humpback creatures were the most interesting part of the show. They had three of them, Looked to be a family, a papa, a mama, and a youngster. They was let out and paraded around all the while the announcer man was com- explaining how, as how they were called camels and come from way across the seas in Egypt, the land of the ancient pharaohs and the pyramids in the Nile River. He said these animals was remarkable on account of how they could walk through dry deserts for days while carrying heavy burdens without taking a single drink of water. I cogitated on that fact while they was paraded around some more. It seemed like a useful talent for a creature to have in a place where there wasn't no water to begin with anyway. Then, to prove how strong they was, circus folks made the papa camel sit down. He complained most bitterly, but folded up his legs and did it. Bundles was piled atop him, and those funny men climbed atop those bundles. Then they forced the camel to rise up again. He groaned and tottered, but made it all the way around the ring before he was let off for some peace. That's when Pa appeared. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' the announcer said, Next, it is my pleasure to present for your amazement and delect- delectation a man as strong as the strongest camel. Stronger, even. The musician tooted his horn a little. The announcer took off his top hat and waved it. Samson, the strongest man in the world. Out came Pa. He had even less clothes on than that swing lady, only effe- the effect weren't quite the same on him. His bare chest and legs were all greased up. He'd even greased up his thatch of straw-colored hair and slicked it all back from his face. He bowed some, then went to the center of the ring where a bunch of heavy-looking weights had been dragged out on the sawdust. Well, Pa proceeded to lift them weights, all of them hanging off bars and marked up in pounds. First the 50-pound weight, easy as pie. Next the 100-pound weight. For this, he had to bend his knees and flex his big muscles a little. 
Then he moved it on to 150. It started to become really interesting when he got to the 200 pound weight. Pa, he grunted a lot and made a few strained faces, but he did it. By the time he's working on the 300 pound bar, that crowd was going wild. They didn't think he could do it, but I knew he could on account of the fact that I've lifted heavier things than that myself. Come rainy season back on the farm, it was me, Uncle Lucas, and the cousins always fetch whenever they'd gone and got a wagon all mired in the mud. Still, Pa made a respectable showing for himself, and I cheered along with everyone else. Finally, there were some fancy horses. The announcer called them Prize Arabians, prancing around with more near-naked ladies on their backs, and then the circus was over. I leaned back after the crowd had filed out and waited for Pa. Simon? My whole body jerked and my eyes flew open. I rubbed them. It had been a long, fairly eventful day. Pa, you finished? He must have been because his regular clothes was back on and he'd rubbed off most of the grease. Except his hair was still slicked back. It made the color much darker. For tonight, let's go somewhere and talk. Where? To my cabin on the steamboat. You get to travel on a steamboat? The whole circus does. We work up and down the Missouri. The Mississippi, too. He was already striding from the tent, so I took off after him. Only thing he did while we was walking along the river was to tuck something into my hand. I peered at it in the dark. What's this? The four bits you lost to Cleaver. I got it back. You need some taking in hand, Simon, if you're dumb enough to get caught by such an old swindle. Swindle? You mean them coconuts? But this fat man just before me, he walked off with the dollar, easy as... He pushed me towards a game plate. Get aboard. That fat man was Joe Sellers. How'd you know his name? I stumbled a little on the unfamiliar slant of the planks. How'd you... He works for the circus, Simon. He ain't nothing but a decoy. I stopped flat on my feet atop the deck. A decoy? Like, to when a person goes hunting? To fool the ducks? But doing that with people? That... That ain't honest, Pa. Pa grinned through the darkness. Welcome to the real world, Simon. The smart keep their money and the suckers get taken. Where you been in your entire life, anyhow? No, don't tell me yet. Wait till we get to my cabin. That cabin was kind of tiny for the two of us, but I managed to sit myself down on one end of the bunk. Pa took the only chair and filled up the rest of the space. Then we started in talking. About your mama, son, Pa began. I want you to know I was struck with grief when she died. Sheer struck. He pulled out a huge handkerchief and ran it past his eyes and then honked into it. I just took myself away in blind sorrow, knowing I'd never love another woman. Somebody knocked at the cabin door. Before either of us could say aught, it opened a crack. Samson, darling? The head of that near-naked lady on the swing popped in. Ready to take me out for supper like you promised? Pa gulped. Lila, something turned up. She shoved in farther, pouting all over. Is that any way to treat your... Then she spied me. Who the devil is that? Well, I blushed from head to foot. First off, here was the lady from the show. True, she'd a few more clothes on now, a skirt even, but her uppers was still practically... I gulped too. On top of which, she'd already used a word I'd never heard on any lady's lips. Why, Miss Rogers would be scandalized clear down to her well-covered ankles. Paul was shambling up. Watch it, Lila. This here's my first and only offspring in the flesh. First and only? She giggled. Pa shoved her back out the door. Later, Lila. Go practice on your trapeze or something. Pa sure liked that word, later. He plopped back into the chair and turned to me. Enough of the preliminaries. What brings you to Jefferson City? So then I had to tell him the whole story. About being graduated and leaving the farm and setting up the business with the turkeys. The entire works. Pa sat there scratching his head after he'd heard me out. The gesture almost made me start in on my own thatch. I knew right well it weren't an itch, but a way of thinking that we both seemed to have. You say you paid two bits apiece for these thousand turkeys, Simon? Sure did. He seemed to keep coming back to those birds of mine. And they're good for five dollars? The head? Come Denver? It's the gospel truth. He pawed through his hair some more. Maybe you ain't as dumb as you let on, Simon. At least about the important things. Mighty nice of you to consider that, Pa. Still... He stopped me. Still and all, there's many a peril between Jefferson City and Denver. You ain't even come to the end of the road yet. You ain't come near to the open prairie or the mountains or the wild engines. Maybe you need a little more help getting that flock safely through. Doing just fine, Pa. Got me top quality helpers already. Any more, just get underfoot. Pa kicked out of his chair and stood up. 
father's place is by the side of his son, Simon, to help him through the trials and tribulations of life. I really think I ought to come along and help out with your little enterprise. I peered up at Pa. It's not that I mistrusted him exactly. He had saved me from the coconut man. He had gotten my four bits back. Miss Rogers' four bits. He had warned me about some circus folks and their ways. Yet with all that, how come you're taking such a sudden interest in my welfare, Pa, seeing that you only just laid eyes on me this very day for the first time in ten years, he said mournfully. He pulled out the handkerchief and honked at his nose some more. That nose was different from mine. It had a big bump toward the top, then broadened out a little crookedly. Must have been broken somewhere along the line. Ten long years. Will I never be forgiven for what sorrow and grief done to me? Will I never be forgiven for abandoning the fruit of my loins at the most tender of ages? He swooped over me. Let me make it up to you, Simon. I'm begging you. Well, he had my heart, head real and worse than that coconut man. I didn't know what to do or say. I needed some good advice fast and quick, but Miss Rogers was nowhere's to be hand. Nowhere's near hand. That only left Bidwell, Peace, and Jabeth. I shoved myself up. Time to be getting back to my camp, Pa. It was right nice bumping into you. His huge body blocked the door. You running off on me, son, after what we just shared? I stopped when he said son. Strange, but it didn't sound the way it did when Mr. Peace called me that, even if I knew for certain sure. I was, even that, even if I knew for certain sure, I wasn't no way connected by blood to my mule skinner. A picture of Bidwell Peace slashed before me. True, he'd been a drunk. True, he still got tempted by the devil's brew. But his eyes was crisp and blue in that image, and they was offering up real affection for me. I shook my head to clear it. Ain't sure I'm your true son, Pa. Ain't sure a man can call a boy that unless they've striven and sweated some together. That's what I'm trying to do, Pa protested. Ain't sure it can be picked up in the middle of things either. I reached past him for the doorknob. Ain't even sure I got me a father at all. But it's something I'll give some thought to. But what about... I managed to get the door partway open. You're welcome to stop by my camp in the morning, Pa, just to the other side of Jefferson City and the post road from St. Louis. You shake a leg, might still be able to get Miss Lila some supper. She looks to need a little feeding up. Jabeth was sacked out cold when I made it back to camp. Emmett, too, sprawled atop his chest. Mr. Peace was up, though. It seemed he'd been pacing around some because he neared a sprung at me when I got into sight of him. Simon, are you all right, son? What happened? I sat down by the fire while he spooned up a big plate of Brunswick stew for me. And then I scratched my head. It's a funny thing, Mr. Peace, but... He was dead on right about trouble in Jefferson City. The ladle stilled in his hand, but he finally got the stew to me. Tell me about it, Simon. Everything. From the beginning. 